Okay, if you want to grab your Bibles, uh, we're in Acts chapter 10 this morning. There are handouts on the back table. Uh, if you would uh, like to have one and uh, uh, like to fill that, uh, there are some blanks on there um, to, uh, to keep you occupied as we study through this. Uh, you don't have to have one. Everything, most everything is on, the, uh, is on the screen with the PowerPoint, but it may be helpful to you. We're in Acts chapter 10 this morning. We're going to take, uh, we're going to take two weeks uh, to cover this. Uh, not only chapter 10, but the first 18 verses uh, of chapter 11. You know, sometimes, sometimes the chapter divisions that are in the Bible sometimes get in our way. Uh, we, we, we are glad that they are there, uh, very helpful to us in finding verses. Uh, but sometimes we come to a chapter division and, and our minds just sort of disconnect um, they, they sometimes just put an automatic disconnection in between those two chapters because we see, okay, here's a new chapter. It's about something different. And uh, such is not the case uh, so often as you're reading the Bible. And uh, such is definitely not the case here in Acts chapter 10. Uh, the, the chapter 10 has 48 verses. Uh, and so that's, that's a long chapter. But those first 18 verses of chapter 11... Uh, you need to have those connected in your mind with chapter 10. Uh, it's uh, because often when we get in discussions with individuals, there will be uh, questions that are brought up about the end of chapter 10 and about uh, salvation and uh, uh, when was it that Cornelius was saved and, and how was that or how was that not um, a part of uh, his baptism and the coming of the Holy Spirit and all of that that we'll talk about. And uh, if, we, if we ignore the first 18 verses of chapter 11, uh, then we're going to miss out uh, on, a, on God's explanation of what happened in chapter 10. Uh, and so just keep that in mind. We're going to go through uh, chapter 10 and then the first uh, part of chapter 11 in these two classes this week and next week. Uh, and then we'll move on after that. But this is, uh, these are in some important verses for us to understand. Um, you know, I, I think you probably think I say this every week, but this is, this is an important chapter. Of course, there's 28 chapters, and I might say that about all of them. Uh, but there are some that are key chapters uh, to our understanding of Scripture. We looked at one in chapter 9 uh, when Saul of Tarsus was converted. Uh, that's, that's a key moment, a uh, key time in the history of the church. And here in chapter 10, it's a key moment, it's a key time in the history of the church because the gospel, uh, the gospel is going to the Gentiles. Uh, aren't you glad that the gospel went to the Gentiles? Are you a little bit uh, uh, relieved that God allowed the gospel to go to the Gentiles? Um, I don't, uh, I'm not seeing a whole, whole lot of folks here this morning that are not of Gentile origin. Uh, and so chapter 10 is important to us, uh, but having a good understanding of it uh, is key. So we're introduced in chapter 10 to a man by, uh, to a man by the name of Cornelius. And uh, he, be, he is the central figure uh, in this chapter. Uh, he is described in those first couple verses. And uh, let's read, those, three, the, read through those first couple verses. Acts chapter 10, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. If you got a Bible map out, uh, it'd probably be good for you to see where Caesarea was uh, or is uh, up the Mediterranean coast from Joppa, about 30 miles north. There's a man there named Cornelius. He was a centurion uh, of what was called, the New King James says, of what was called the, the Italian Regiment. Or you might have the word cohort uh, there uh, instead of the word regiment. Um, there's another word and I can't remember what it is. What else do you have there? Band, that's what it was. The Italian band. This had nothing to do with trombones and drums. Um, it might have had something to do with trumpets uh, because we are talking about an army here. Uh, but here, here is uh, uh, Cornelius, a centurion. Uh, I think we read about uh, six centurions in the New Testament. He's one of them. And most of the time they're presented in a positive light, which is interesting because they're, uh, they're, they are Roman uh, officials uh, who are in charge of a hundred soldiers. And here he is, a part of the Italian uh, regiment, the Italian cohort. That was made up of 600 soldiers. Now look at how he's described in verse 2. He was a devout man. 
He's very um, reverent uh, in, in his uh, devotion to God. He was one who feared God with all his household. Which God did he fear? The true God. He feared the God of heaven. He feared the God of the Old Testament. He feared Jehovah God. So uh, it's not that uh, he fears uh, some idol. He feared the God of heaven. He feared him with all of his house. He was a leader in his home. He gave alms, middle of verse 2 says, he gave alms generously to the people. And he prayed to God always. What kind of man is this? What kind of man are we introduced to in chapter 10? He's a Gentile. Is, is, he, uh, uh, is, he, a, uh, is he a pagan? Is, uh, is he someone who uh, is, is going to be uh, a difficult task to, uh, to undertake? Is he somebody that has to be convinced of the existence of God? Does he have to be drawn away from, uh, from idolatry? Here's somebody who believes in God. doesn't just believe in God. He fears God. He prays to God. Now what's interesting about this man is that as devout and as religious as he was, this man is not saved. You go over it. Look in verse 22 and we'll jump through some of these verses. Verse 22, Cornelius the centurion... Uh, he was a just man, who, one who fears God. He has a good reputation uh, uh, among the people. Look down in verse 30, uh, where it says that he had, uh, he had spent time fasting. Uh, and uh, while he was fasting, and this is Cornelius' rendition of it in verse 30, while he was fasting, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Go back to verse 3. What is verse 3? Who does verse 3 say came to him? An angel. An angel stood before him in verse 3. When Cornelius is explaining this in verse 30, who does he say was before him? A man. Is that a contradiction? No. What did the angel look like? Angel looked like a man. Um, so here is an angel that takes on uh, a human appearance. This angel comes to Cornelius. Would that get your attention? An angel comes to you. A man comes to you in bright clothing. He calls you by name. You don't know him. He calls you by name in verse 3. Cornelius, what is it, Lord? Lowercase l. Uh, what is it, Lord? It's just a, an expression of respect. Wouldn't, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you be respectful to somebody who came to you? In, uh, in bright clothing, you didn't know and said your name? Uh, maybe you wouldn't be. I don't know. You live in South Florida. Maybe some of that South Florida's uh, dug into your blood and, and you wouldn't be uh, respectful. But here's Cornelius. He says, what is it, Lord? What, what, what do you want? What can we do? In verse 4, uh, the angel said, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa. That's where Peter was. For Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. New King James, King James says, He will tell you what you must do. When the angels who spoke to him had departed, verse 7, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And when he ex had explained all of these things to him, he sent them to Joppa. Here's Cornelius who sees this vision. He's told to send for a man named Simon, whose surname is Peter. Where is Simon lodging? Simon's lodging with Simon. Uh, Simon is lodging with Simon, a man who's a tanner. We didn't get to finish chapter 9 last time, but look at the very end of chapter 9. Uh, after, uh, after Peter had raised Tabitha from the dead... Uh, verse 43, the last verse of chapter 9 says that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. Now, this is about all we know about this man named Simon is that he's a tanner. You go down to chapter 10 and verse 6, 
He's called Simon a tanner. And then you go down later, uh, I think it's verse 32, uh, is where Cornelius is again recounting this uh, occasion. And he says there that, he, that, Simon, that Peter was staying with Simon a tanner by the sea. This is all we know about that. He's a tanner. What's a tanner? A what? A, a leather worker. A tanner is someone who worked with, with animal hides uh, to, to, make, uh, to make a variety of, uh, uh, whether it be clothing or, or, uh, or uh, maybe upholstery for his uh, chariot uh, or a nice lazy boy. Maybe he invented the lazy boy uh, recliner. But here's a tanner. Uh, where, do you get, uh, where do you get leather? Where do you get hides? Usually from dead animals, right? Um, to a Jew, what was a dead animal? Here's something that's unclean. You look at Peter, and you look at Peter when we get to chapter 10, where he, he is having to be convinced by God to go to the Gentiles because they are unclean. Here is Peter who, when we see this in chapter 10, when God says, rise, kill, and eat, what does Peter say? No way, Lord. I, 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 I've never, uh, I wouldn't have anything to do with something that's common or unclean. And yet, where is he lodging? He's lodging with a man named Simon who's a tanner. Tanners were ones who dealt with dead animals uh, and uh, would have been dealing with their, with their bodies, with their skins, Perhaps we see Peter coming around a little bit, staying with Simon the Tanner. Because uh, probably Peter in his old days would not have had anything to do with this man. Because just being in his home around these uh, uh, dead animals. And where is his home, by the way? Down by the sea. Uh, why would that be significant? If you were a tanner, why would you have your home down by the sea? Dry, okay, to, uh, to help dry out the skins. They used the, uh, they used the sea water in the uh, treatment of the skins. Um, do you be, would you believe that there would be some kind of an odor that might be involved in working with dead animals? How would you like to just be out there by the sea so you could have the nice sea breeze to come in and uh, uh, clean out that odor? So here's, here's Peter dwelling with Simon the Tanner. And uh, Cornelius is told to send for him. If you've got your hand out, drop down to the bottom of the first page. What are some truths that we need to learn uh, as we go through this chapter? One thing that we need to learn is that even though Cornelius was a godly man, even though he's a very religious man, he was still lost. And I don't believe that God put these details in here about Cornelius and his faith just by accident. Why? Why? If, if, you were to, if you were to survey the book of Acts, if you were to survey the New Testament, and you were to come across when God introduces a new character in, into, the, into the narrative of the Bible. Here's Cornelius. We don't know anything about him, and he's introduced to us. Why would God take the time to tell us what kind of man he was? Remember, this is for us. This detail about Cornelius was not for Peter. It was not for, uh, it was not for Paul. It was not for the apostle. The book of Acts was written for us. Why would God choose to tell us what kind of man Cornelius was? What difference does it make? To show us, as Tommy said, that you can be religious and be lost at the same time. Well, how do we know he was lost? Chapter 11 and verse 14 is an important verse for you to have 
plugged away. And remember to ignore that chapter division here. Because when you take all, when you take all of what we read in these 66 verses, 48 in chapter 10, 18 in chapter 11. When you take all that we learn in these 66 verses, what do we learn about, what do we learn about Cornelius? We learn that he was to send to Joppa for a man named Peter who would come and speak to him words. What does chapter 11 and verse 14 say? Words by which he, Cornelius, and his household might be saved. If Peter needed to come and preach to them so they could be saved, then what were they? That's not hard. They're obviously lost. He's lost, and yet what does God tell us about him? He's devout. He, he, he's, not, he's not some kind of a slacker uh, in, in his faith. He is devout. He feared God. What does that mean? He respected God. He stands in awe of God, verse 2. He feared God with all of his household. What kind of man is this? He not only believed in God and feared God himself, he made sure that everybody else in his house did. With all of his household. Here's a strong, godly father, a family man. He gave alms generously to the poor. Notice the Bible doesn't say he just gave alms to the poor. Here was a man who gave generously to the, to, to the people. Is he a Jew? No, he's not a Jew. And yet... Some of the people he could have been giving to were likely Jews who hated him. He prayed to God. How often does verse 2 say that he prayed to God? Continually. Here's a man that may have been praying to God more than you and I pray to God. He prayed to God always. Here's a man that we saw in verse 22 is described as a just man. Some translations say in verse 22 that he was a righteous man. He had a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews. Would that, would that have been hard to come by? You're a Gentile. That, that's strike one against you for having a good reputation. You are a Roman soldier. Strike two against you for having a good reputation among the Jews. You are a Roman centurion. That means you're over this, these Roman soldiers. Strike three. He doesn't, what does he have going for him? Well, if you take those things, he doesn't, did he have to work in order to have a good reputation among the Jews? Here's a man who was religious. You look in verse 30. How many people do you know that fast? What does that tell you about how uh, pious this man was? Four days ago, I was fasting, verse 30, until this hour. And yet, the Bible says that this man wasn't saved. There's, uh, there's a lesson in that for us. Uh, God does not put these details in here uh, simply to fill up space. He puts all of these details in here so that we can recognize, you know, just because I might look good on the outside and just because I might have a, a faith in God. Oh, he, there's no doubt he believed in God. That's right. And so we learn that, that faith or that salvation, the salvation does not come by faith only. This man had to be taught the scriptures and he had to obey the scriptures in order to be saved. Now, what else do we see with Cornelius? The, the, back, the back side of your handout, letter B, what other truth can we learn from this? And I want you to hear this carefully because I don't want you to misunderstand this. It is sometimes stated, it's frequently stated, that an alien sinner is not saved by prayer. Is that true? Well, that's, the Bible nowhere says that, that, that we can be saved by prayer. Sometimes it's stated another way, that God does not hear a sinner's prayer. That's stating it a little bit different. On the one hand, 
sinners are not saved by praying. And that's true because the Bible does not teach that a sinner is saved by praying. The sinner's prayer is not found anywhere in Scripture, and yet that's, that's so common for man to say today, that's what man needs to do to be saved. But say it, to, to say it another way, that God does not hear a sinner's prayer. Now, what is usually meant by that, not what does that statement mean, but what is usually intended by that statement is that God does not save a sinner when he prays. Just because a sinner prays to be saved, God does not save that sinner. Or more, uh, more closely it would be said that God does not answer a sinner's prayer. Is God obligated to answer a sinner's prayer? No. God is obligated to... Okay. All right. His answer may be no. Richard's very good about keeping me straight and uh, making sure I don't leave any loopholes. Um, God's eyes are over the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of God is against those who do evil. The book of Proverbs says that the prayer, uh, the prayer of a sinner is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, does it use the word abomination? I've forgotten the verse already. Is an, is an abomination before God. Now, let's back up and let's ask this question. If a sinner prays and asks God to save him, is God going to answer that prayer and save him from his sins because he's asked him to save him from his sins? No, that's not the way salvation comes. If a sinner prays, does God know that that sinner has said a prayer? Are you sure? Does he hear a sinner when they pray? Here's Cornelius. Is he a sinner? Is he lost? If he's a sinner and he's lost, then God shouldn't be listening to his prayers, right? Did God hear his prayers? Your prayers have come up. What is, is it verse 4? Your prayers have come up as a remembrance, as a memorial before God. You go over to verse 30. Verse thir is it verse 30 or verse 31? 31. Your prayer has been heard. And your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Ruth, you had your hand up and then I'll make another comment. Good. That's right. That's right. That's the key, is that God knows the heart of every person. He knows the heart of every person. If God knows the heart of every person, does He know the desires of that heart? If someone is seeking truth, does God know that? How did God know that the Ethiopian in chapter 8 was going to be seeking truth. He knew the man's heart. He knew he was going to be longing to find truth. And what did God do? He brought a man into his path in order to teach him the gospel. John 7 and verse 17 says, If any man wills, if anybody wants to do his will, John 7, 17, it will be made known to him. If someone hungers and thirsts after righteousness, Matthew 5 and verse 6. What does the Bible say? It's going to be filled. Does God know a person's heart? Yes, he does. Richard and then Chris. Yes. Yes. 
Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, the, the eyes of the Lord search. Uh, is that the passage that says that they go to and fro uh, over all the earth? Um, you know, th- th- there's, 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 there's something that's hard for us to fathom. I'll get to you, Chris. There's something that's hard for us to, to fully put together. What do our sins do to our relationship with God? Separate us from God. They, they not only separate us from God, but the Bible says the face of the Lord is turned away from sin. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13. It, we, we know uh, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, that our sins separate us from God, perhaps better than we know Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, where it says that the eyes of the Lord are too holy, they're too pure to behold evil. God cannot look upon evil. There's a separation there. And yet, does he know the heart of every man? Yes. Is every man a sinner? And yet, God knows their heart. In Matthew chapter 12... Matthew chapter 12, verses 34, 35, 36, and 37. Verse 36 says that we will give an account for every word that we speak. Is that true or not true? That's got to be true. Well, how does God know the words that I speak when I'm a sinner if He doesn't know what I'm doing when I'm a sinner? We've got to balance that out to understand what Scripture really says. Chris? right there, there's God first uh, Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 says God wants all men to be saved is that true second Peter 3 verse 9 says he's not willing that any should perish if he doesn't want anybody to perish and he wants all to be saved if there's somebody searching for truth even if that one is lost and that one says to says to God in prayer however he thinks he can say it to God God, help me to find the truth. Is God going to bring truth into that person's life? Yeah, that's what Scripture says. So I I want us to at least see that connection. Those two points that no, prayer does not save a sinner. Uh, And yes, you can be religious and not be saved. And yet, if God knows that you're searching, He's going to bring someone uh, into your... Not that He's going to force you to obey it. You know, it may be that once you hear it, you say, oh, that's what it is. Nope, don't want that. Never mind. Wasn't looking for, you may not have that love for the truth in 2 Thessalonians 2, um, but he will give you an opportunity to hear it. All right, come back to, uh, come back to verse, to verse 10 or verse 9. Continue in this event. Verse 9 begins with the next day. You have Cornelius seeing the angel one day. The next day, Peter has a vision. Um, Look at verse 9. Next day, as they went on their journey, the two uh, servants and the soldier that Cornelius had sent, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. What time was that? Noon. When when, when was, was, we didn't notice, we didn't say this back in verse 3. When did did Cornelius uh, see his vision? In verse 3, about the ninth hour, what time was that? Three o'clock. Um, go, go, back to, uh, go back to chapter 3 for just a second. Look at the very first verse of chapter 3. Peter and John went up together to the temple... At the hour of prayer, the Jewish hour of prayer, what time was that? Chapter 3, verse 1. The ninth hour, 3 o'clock. So the Jewish hour of prayer was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour. 
when you come to chapter 10 and verse 3, when did Peter see the vision? When did he see the angel coming to him? Three o'clock, the ninth hour. What was, Corn did I say Peter? What was Cornelius doing? What was Cornelius doing? Look in verse 30. Um, look in verse 30. Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. Uh, does New American Standard, what is it? it says something like to this, to this very hour. Is that what it says? It, it was almost to the very minute, but it's to the very hour. So it had been almost exactly, I guess, um, 96 hours, four days. He says, I was fasting until this very hour. And at the ninth hour, verse 30, he says, I prayed in my house. Where had he learned this? He's a Gentile. He's a Roman soldier. But apparently it had contact with some Jews somewhere along the way, had learned of the God of the Jews and was even praying to the God of the Jews at the hour that the Jews prayed. At the ninth hour, he was praying. That's when the angel came and appeared to him. So come back to when Peter saw his vision in, in verse 9. Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. That's noon. Verse 10 says, then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. Does that describe you around noon? Describes me. All right. Peter and I have got that in common. At noon, it's time to eat. He became very hungry. He wanted to eat. But while they made ready, while they were preparing uh, the meal in the house, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound by the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In the sheet were all kinds, which would mean clean and unclean. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals uh, of the earth. There were wild beasts, there were creeping things. There were some two-footed animals called birds too of the air, they were all inside this sheet. What's, what would that have looked like? I mean, is your bed, is your bed sheet large enough to, to hold all of those animals? We're not talking stuffed animals, right? I mean, it, you, maybe your stuffed animals will fit. How, how in, in Peter's mind, how massive is this coming down? Full of all of these animals. And then he hears a voice in verse uh, 13. A voice came to him, said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. I don't know that I had thought about this before this point at right now, but had Peter heard that voice before? A voice came to him. What did it sound like? Did it sound like the same voice that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased? Had Peter ever heard that? Yeah. Peter had heard that. Had Peter heard this voice? Did he recognize the voice? If you had heard God speak at one point, if you heard that voice again, you think you'd recognize it? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that, that that voice would have... That sound would have been imprinted on your soul. Yeah, I'll recognize that voice again. Because if he calls me on the phone, I, you know, I don't want to be tricked into thinking he's somebody else. A voice came and said, rise, Peter. Kill and eat. What's the first word you have in verse 14? Isn't that a great word for Peter? The word but. That, that just sort of describes Peter. Peter. Uh, here, here's, here's what Peter is supposed to do, but uh, Peter didn't always do what he was supposed to do. But Peter said, can you imagine? Can you imagine saying this? Not so, Lord. Now, no doubt he feels that this is a test. No way, Lord, not me, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Now that is, that's pretty good to be able to say as a Jew, isn't it? As a Jew, that's, 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 a, that's a, a moment of pride. No way, Lord, 
I have never eaten anything common or unclean. I, I, that's not me, Lord, you know me. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. If you ever had to tell your children to do something a second time, was your voice a little different the second time? Was it a little more straightforward the second time? That was the first bell, right? All right, good. A voice came to him the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Don't you dare call common what God has cleansed. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. Not just once, three times. So, so this, this sheet comes down with all of these animals. Three times Peter sees this sheet. Three times a voice says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Three times the voice says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Comes down, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Do not call what God has cleansed common. Over and over and then it goes back. If you were Peter, how many times did Peter deny Christ? Three times. How many times did, Peter, did Jesus ask Peter in John 21, do you love me? Three times. How many times does God have to show Peter this vision? Three times. That's a magic number for Peter. Yeah, the resurrection of Christ was on the third day. Go back to Genesis 41. We'll finish with this, I guess, because we'll run out of time otherwise. Look in Genesis chapter 41. And uh, I, I don't know that this has um, the significance uh, that, uh, that we see here. Look in Genesis 41. Pharaoh of Egypt had had a dream. And Joseph had come to tell Pharaoh of his dreams and to interpret those dreams to Pharaoh. And that's what's happening uh, in this context. And uh, this is the, uh, the dream of the seven years of famine and the seven years of plenty. Um, look at verse 31, Genesis 41, verse 31. So the plenty will not be known in that land because of the famine following it, for it will be very severe. So the famine, the seven years of famine was going to come and completely deplete those seven years of plenty. And the dream, verse 32 is what I want us to see in Genesis 41. The dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice. How many times did Pharaoh have this dream? Three times. How many times did Peter see this vision? Three times. Why would God repeat the same dream to Pharaoh twice? Well, the Bible tells us here in verse 32. The dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because, and he gives two reasons, because the thing is established by God and, number two, God will shortly bring it to pass. I don't know if there's a connection between God doing something three times with Pharaoh and God doing something three times with Peter. Why did he do it three times with Pharaoh? So that Pharaoh would know this is from God and that God's going to do this soon. Why did he do it with Peter three times? Perhaps to say, Peter, this message is from God. And this is something that is going to come to pass soon. How soon? So soon that the men that Cornelius sent were there knocking on the door, ready for Peter to go with them. Next week, we're going to look at Peter's, Peter's reaction. Uh, how, how did Peter respond uh, to, this, uh, to this particular occasion? Verse 17 tells us his reaction. He was continually perplexed. He didn't know what to think about the vision he had just seen. But God tells him, you go with these men. And he did what God told him to do. 
Next week we're going to look at Peter preaching to the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit coming uh, upon them and what all of that means. Thank you so much for your good attention and participation this morning.